the water is off Key Largo, Jesus is getting a little fuzzy. The Christ of the Abyss statue, donated by an Italian artist, has stood here 40 years, providing divine protection for divers, and long enough to see Florida's spectacular coral reefs covered by a carpet of algae. Fat, bushy weeds fed with a daily infusion of fertilizer and sewage. According to marine ecologist Brian LaPointe, partially treated sewage, leaky septic tanks, and farm runoff thick with nutrients are transforming the underwater landscape. At Lou Key, in particular, uh, over the last two decades, we have lost 95% or more of the Elkhorn coral. So that reef is, is a dying reef. Every day, millions of gallons of partially treated sewage swirl out of this pipe near Hollywood, Florida. It's one of many up and down the coast. Fish swarm the mouth, chomping at particles in the wastewater. Divers call it the poop chute. And LaPointe says this helps feed the green tide that is wiping out the last remaining coral reefs on the continental United States. The sewage outfall that we saw today is delivering nitrogen at approximately 1,000 times higher than the ammonium threshold that we have determined uh, is required to cause this phase shift from corals to algae. Lou Key was once one of Florida's premier sites for scuba divers. LaPointe remembers when the water was clear, the reef healthy and the fish abundant. Now he fears there will be a new generation of divers who think this is the way the reef should be. If a manatee is sleeping, do not swim over top of him or too close to him. Swimming with the manatees is big business on Florida's west coast. Tourists are almost guaranteed a manatee encounter. They number more than 3,000 now and have been reclassified by the state as threatened with extinction, not endangered. But these waters are also home to blooms of toxic algae. Locals call it red tide, and it threatens to bring those numbers back down again. The brevitoxin released by the algae during a red tide can hover just above the water's surface. Manatees coming up for a breath of air inhale lethal amounts. In 2005, 88 manatees died of toxic shock in these waters, and that's kept Andy Garrett busy. As a biologist with the State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Garrett spent a lot of time last year retrieving dead manatees. This one was found near a marina. I said, I don't see any obvious watercraft trauma to it right now. Uh, we can't rule that totally out. But uh, red tide animals typically will bleed a lot from the nose. The animals are brought back to a pathology lab where researchers perform necropsies to determine the cause of death. Scientists are finding that the toxins trigger a cascade of nerve and tissue damage that fills the lungs with blood and other fluids. Florida's red tide seems to be occurring more often, lasting longer, and is more intense. It might be caused by pollution and farm runoff, or by iron-rich dust blown west from the Sahara, or both. But now it's on the long list of human and natural stresses that threaten the survival of these gentle marine mammals. The islands of the Hawaiian archipelago act like the teeth of a giant comb, snagging debris drifting around the Pacific. Just walking on the Big Island's Camilo Beach can be hazardous. Decades ago, Noni Sanford walked these beaches looking for driftwood. Now this is where she can get all she needs for the annual Hilo Trash Art Show. Well, before the first cleanup, just, you know, right next to me here, this was, I can see, eight to ten feet high and nothing but junk. The first time I was down here, um, you basically drove over plastic. There was almost, you couldn't see sand on the beach. Retired wildlife biologist Bill Gilmartin has been organizing beach cleanups for a couple of years now. The beach was just solid nets and other kinds of plastic debris. Tons of trash have been removed, but more keeps coming, brought here by the tides. We bring people down here that um, have seen other beaches uh, even and thought they were bad beaches till they saw this one. Uh, and uh, 
they're shocked. For Charles Moore, the shock came when he sailed his catamaran through the North Pacific subtropical gyre, mile after mile of floating trash. Spurred into action, he returned two years later to conduct a high sea survey. It wasn't just the big stuff he was pulling out of the oceans. With a fine mesh net used to collect plankton, Moore noticed the ocean was full of a confetti of plastic. Some of it broken fragments and some of it still in pellet form, the raw materials for most plastic products. Moore says it's places like this Southern California rail yard that are the source of most of the pellets. It's a pellet beach. Uh, this particular rail yard has more tonnage of pellets on the ground that have the potential to reach the uh, catch basins, storm drains, rivers, and oceans than any place else uh, that I've surveyed. This is the LA River where it empties into the ocean. Booms corral some of the trash that surges down the channel after a rainstorm. But much of it slips past and rides the currents for thousands of miles. A plastic plume that is transforming the ocean in ways that are unmistakable. Midway Atoll. It's one of the most geographically remote places in the world, but there's plenty of activity. This speck in the middle of the Pacific is a major rookery for seabirds such as petrels, terns, and especially the Laysan albatross. Each year, a half million albatross chicks are born here. They spend their first six months on land, and they are entirely dependent on what the parents find foraging at sea. A slurry of fish eggs and squid is typical. So is the plastic. And here we got a couple customers. Brian Peterson is a paramedic assigned to the atoll. And we don't have a lot of business as far as uh, island personnel. So we do other things to keep ourselves busy. And one of the things is picking up dead birds. And we've just collected uh, probably about 50 birds this morning. We'll just uh, leave them here and then they'll get either burned or covered up uh, a little bit later today. Two out of every five chicks born will die before they lose that downy fuzz. Dehydration and starvation. The sheer volume of the plastic doesn't leave room for food and liquid. Okay, this, I'm opening up the stomach now. Wildlife biologist John Clavitter. We oftentimes find um, lighters in here, uh, little light bulbs, uh, toothbrushes, uh, anything that floats that basically an albatross can eat, they'll, they'll have in their stomachs. The North Pacific subtropical gyre is a clockwise swirl of plastic debris. Some of the trash gets hung up for decades before it spins out into different currents, or is picked up by an animal, or ends up on an island beach. Tons and tons of marine trash, and about four-fifths of it comes from land, swept out of coastal cities and into the sea. Unfortunately, you know, over time, plastics will probably become more and more prevalent in our oceans, so I hate to be pessimistic, but I'm sure the problem will become worse before it becomes better.